Good morning and welcome to another International Connection. We're continuing with our series on mind control. This is the 12th in the series, and this will be continuing another five months on CKLN on this time slot. Um, today we're going to be hearing an interview with Valerie Wolf, Claudia Mullen, and Chris Ebner just after they had given testimony of mind control and radiation experimentation done to, done to them as children to the Presidential Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments. Valerie Wolf is a therapist of Claudia Mullen and Chris Ebner, both survivors of torture and abuse as part of mind control experiments conducted by the U.S. government. We heard six weeks ago on this show the actual testimony given at the radiation hearings. Today we're going to hear an interview conducted by a local cable station hearings. Today we're going to hear an interview conducted by a local cable TV producer from Miss Missoula, Montana. Claudia and Chris describe how the mind control doctors induced dissociation or multiple personalities through traumatization and abuse for the purpose of programming the personalities to perform various military intelligence and criminal acts. You're listening to CKLN 88.1, and now that interview. Valerie, you testified today at the President's Council on Radiation. Mm -hmm. uh, along with two of your clients, and a story unfolded there, which America should hear, probably many Americans will not believe when they hear it, but in your work as a professional therapist, what have you found with respect to children and experimentation? Basically, what we as therapists across the country are finding are a group of clients that formerly were considered untreatable that based on recent information we're finding are reporting having been subjects in uh, mind control experimentation performed by the government, the CIA and the military establishment probably from about the late 1940s until middle 80s and may even still be going on today. Is there any official documentation of these protocols or these experiments? There is some documentation of it. Um, there was a, re a commission on mind control in the late 70s, but it mostly focused on the use of adults, prisoners, and mental patients. What got missed were the children that were being used in these experiments. And the reason I think that the children were missed is because they were either too young uh, to speak out at that time or they were still involved in the, the experimentation. When did you uh, first receive either written documentation or electromagnetic information about this? Is this something that's circulating within the, uh, the group of therapists uh, nationally? Basically, um, the information was released at the uh, uh, regional conference, Eastern Regional Conference on Multiple Personality and Dissociative Disorders in June of 92. Um, those of us that were working with severely dissociated clients um, listened to the information and followed up with it. I myself have had contact with seven clients that report being subjects in these experiments. Um, and the way that I have proceeded is I have deliberately not read any of the documentation or read any of the books because there are several books written on this. Basically, what I've done is, as my clients' memories have emerged, I've sent the information to Alan Shefflin, who's an expert in this area, to validate the memories. And I've done that so that I, he'll, he'll call me back and say, do you know about such and such? Do you know about such and such? I have no clue about any of this. And these clients are real sensitive to everything, so that if I knew something, I don't want to cue them or give them information or contaminate their memories. So basically the memories are coming absolutely um, with total free recall. There's no cueing from me. In fact, they'll tell you that I basically say very little. Um, I don't give them any information as far as what's going on, only as their, their memories come up and to validate the memories. Mr. Shefflin has filed some FOIA or Freedom of Information requests. We heard that today at yes. the hearing. Have there been documents uh, provided by the government to him? It's been very difficult. He spent 20 years of his life gathering information on this. A lot of the requests for Freedom of Information Act information have been slowed down or denied. Uh, it's very difficult to get this information, and that was one of the reasons we appeared at the Radiation Commission today, because um, in an attempt to ask them to recommend or 
an investigation of this and also to help us open the files and get the information we need. Because we need to, being responsible, we need, we want to know if what these clients are saying is true. Now, what I have found in terms of the stuff that I've sent and other therapists have found is that some of it can be verified and that they are telling the truth. And some of the information we're supplying can only come, is not published anywhere. It can only come if you file Freedom of Information Act information. And um, obviously these clients haven't, but they know things that there's no way that they could know unless they went through the experience. There are things that can't even be found through Freedom of Information Act, like the identity of people yeah. that were hidden, uh, the description. Mm -hmm. That's right. Your two clients here, uh, Claudia and Chris, uh, met through your practice. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, the encounter and the discovery that both of you had been involved in Central Intelligence Agency or U.S. government experimentation. How did this all come to light uh, between the two of you as clients? Between Chris and I? Yes. Uh, there wasn't any uh, uh, connection between Chris and I. Uh, I hadn't seen her for two years, and the last time I saw her, I was being treated for post-traumatic stress disorder for something that happened to me that had nothing to do with this. I had no memory of being a, uh, a victim of this. Chris had no memory. So as far as Chris and I, uh, I didn't even know that she was, um, although I knew she was Valerie's patient, I didn't know that she was uh, recovering memories just like I was because she doesn't discuss one patient with another, one client with another. So there isn't any connection between Chris and I, other than the fact that we have the same therapist. But you did have the same doctor at one time. Uh, Dr. Green. Oh, well, yes. Do Chris, would you like to talk about Dr. Green? Sure. Yes, um, Dr. Green performed uh, radiation as well as mind control and drug experiments on me. Between uh, 1966 and 1976, and uh, it was done out in the desert, and he worked uh, really uh, on mind control with me. He was uh, he did use radiation experiments on me, as far as uh, I remember him doing some radiation experiments on my uterus and. Uh, my chest, throat, neck, um, things like that. Uh, he also, um, but his main objective with me was to uh, groom me into, actually to gain total control of my mind and uh, to split it apart into as many different um, areas as he could and um, develop me into a spy assassin. And... Uh, as I resisted him more and more, um, he turned it all against me. Um, he used uh, different sorts of uh, trauma techniques and um, basically trauma, drugs, uh, messages, post-hypnotic suggestions, and then more trauma. So uh, basically what he wanted was to get me to self-destruct. Valerie, how do we know that the CIA was targeting certain children, certain types of children? How do they recruit these children if, they, in fact, that's what they were doing? The information that I had is that what they were looking for were children who were already traumatized, who were already abused, um, children who were very intelligent, children who had good memories. Um, and so what they would do is look in clinics, a lot of the kids from military families. Um, in Chris's case, her father had military connections. Um, 
and he actually started grooming her. Some of the parents felt, and you have to understand, we're talking Cold War mentality where this started. And, and we forget about that sometimes the, in terms of fighting communism and the end justifies the means and the kind of thought that was available at that time. So there were people that thought they were truly doing something for their country. There were also people that were really sadistic and people that were pedophiles that uh, hurt their children. And so what they were looking for were kids that were already abused. Claudia, what are your earliest recollections of this process? Of the project? Of uh, being involved? Uh, yes. How did, the, uh, how did the government select you? And what do you remember about it? Well, I was brought to Tulane University uh, by my mother. I had been abused since the time I, I was, t you know, two years old. and. Um, she was friends with chairman, the chairman of the board, Mr. Fenner, at the time. And she asked for a recommendation of the top psychiatrist in New Orleans. And Dr. Robert G. Heath, who was head of the department at Tulane University Medical School, um, was recommended. And he, as a favor, took me on as a, a private client. Uh, he said he didn't treat children, but he would make an exception. And... He said he would treat me for free. Well, my mother was, you know, she signed a consent for anything that he deemed necessary. And he came up with a diagnosis of schizophrenia, childhood schizophrenia, and uh, aberrant behavior. Uh, just to, you know, have something to put down in the medical records. What he was doing, actually, was he had already agreed to receive, I believe, something along the lines of uh, $30,000 at first. No. $300,000 at first over, for over so many years for Tulane in exchange for using a whole ward of uh, patients or subjects that he could get, as many, you know, as many as he could fit, and conduct experiments on them. He was already involved in research on brain mapping and uh, doing all sorts of brain experiments. And... He was considered one of the top in his field, and so they went to him and asked. And I just happened to get sent there at the age of seven. And from then, I kept going back for treatments, I was told. I would not recall when I left what had happened while I was there. Dr. Heath would tell me what had happened. I'd go home, and then the next time they needed me, they would call my mother and say she needs to come back for a treatment. I go over there, and um, you know the same thing. I wouldn't remember when I went home. So in between, I had no memory. Valerie, you had two clients then who had come to you in adult life yeah. with some very very serious problems. You had some information mm -hmm. about programming. Had you at that time put two and two together with respect to these two clients? Did you suspect that they had been part of a government program? What happened? Um, actually, when each of them first became my client, I had absolutely no idea. The way that um, I discovered it with Chris was that um, a couple of months after I got the information, she started showing some of the behaviors that had been described and started the downhill slide that usually led in these kinds of clients to the hospital. So out of sheer desperation, I figured, well, this is worth a try, um, started some very, very careful uh, gentle inquiries and uncovered, I mean, it was like whammo, <laughs> there it was. <laughs> and literally, that's the way it was. What did you find? What were the, what was displayed to you that led you to believe it? Well, basically, um, what she was showing was this really compulsive behavior to hurt herself, really compulsive behavior to um, kill herself, um, do her self-destruct kinds of stuff. And it was like a repetitive thing. And the puzzling thing about it is Chris really didn't want to die. So why was she doing these kinds of things? And it was like it was something that was separate from her. Plus, she would had all these years of therapy and good therapy before she came to me. I mean, what, 12 years or 10 years of therapy before she came to me and uh, had had good therapy. And she'd made progress, but not to the degree that you would expect. And those were the kinds of things that were talked about. And those are the kinds of things that I've come to understand. You know, when you have good therapy and clients aren't making progress, you're missing something. 
And so when I started making very indirect, non-leading kinds of inquiries, basically what happened was is we got into um, memories of electric shock, memories of um, codes, um, things like that that we started working with. And basically, I mean, that's what... And then, um, but there had been no mention of her being government subject. And I never brought it up with her. Um, even though I knew that that's what it meant, what she was, and we were working it through therapeutically. But I had never said a word to her. And a couple of months ago, maybe four or five months ago, after finishing a memory, Chris asked for a, piece, a paper and pencil and started writing out CIA confidential memos. And that was the first that, uh, and I had never mentioned anything about CIA involvement to her. As far as Claudia is concerned, she came to me with the same kind of thing where, um, I mean, she's bright, she's verbal, and um, she wasn't making, I mean, she was working real hard in therapy, and we were working through stuff, and um, she ended up in the hospital, which is unusual for the kinds of things. I mean, I have 22 years of experience in dealing with abuse and these kinds of things. And so uh, one day she came in after about nine months of therapy with a piece of paper with words written all over it, and in the middle was MK Ultra. And MK Ultra is the name of the is one of the names of one of the projects associated with the mind control. And that's when I knew that she was involved. I had never also said anything to her about it. Claudia, at the time when you brought this document in, mm -hmm. did you know what it was or where it came from? I had from? no idea what the word meant. I, I didn't know what it stood for. I didn't know. It, it was just something that started uh, coming forward in my memory. And I would get bits and pieces. I would, I would, say, I would remember doctors names of doctors, and I, I'd say, have you ever heard of this man? Who is he? I don't know. You know, Valerie didn't know. I would remember, I started remembering treatments. But it was just bits and pieces. It wasn't like, I couldn't remember whole weeks at a time. I had gaps. I'd always had gaps in my childhood that I couldn't remember, gaps of time that were lost. I didn't know why. And then I came to understand that I was abused by my mother. So I, I assumed that that was... You know, and that's why I went to treatment, it was for post-traumatic stress syndrome, and uh, and then eventually I learned that I was abused by my mother. But that I thought that was the extent of it. I I had never had any clue. I didn't even recall ever being to Tulane University Medical Center. Never, never remember going there. I never thought I'd been to Washington D.C., but I had. Do both of you now remember going into? Uh, laboratories or clinics or uh, being involved in immersion therapies or dark rooms, those kinds of things? Yes. Chris? Um, uh, I remember being in a laboratory uh, in uh, 1966. I was four years old um, and I was strapped down on a table and uh, on my back I was naked. I had electrodes all over my body. Uh, my head, temples, um, uh, chest, stomach, back, legs, and uh, Dr. Green was there, and uh, there were other children in the room as well, and it was a laboratory at, at Kansas City University, and um, I remember him saying that uh, he had a, what looked like an overhead projector, and um, he was uh, saying that, and he had a red flashing light, and he said that he was going to burn images in my brain, and that I would do whatever he told me to do, and how the images would go deeper and deeper into my brain, and that, you know, just consistently repeating the information along with um, electric shock, um, and uh, he would use the electric shock and then he would use the, 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 the imagery and then more electric shock and drugs um, to make me drowsy. Um, sometimes I, I would pass out, whatever. But, yes, I do remember that. Uh, I remember being in a dark room as well. Um, actually, a lot of the experiments took place in a dark room um, at, out in the desert in Tucson, Arizona.
uh, most of the experiments took place there with Dr. Green. People today at the hearing asked, where were your parents? How did this happen? How could you be taken out from your home or, or the place where you lived uh, and brought into this situation? Uh, my parents were divorced uh, around when I was four years old, uh, a little before. And uh, my mom had no knowledge, but my father was involved in the experiments. Don Ebner, Donald Richard Ebner, my father, um, was involved with Dr. Green, and uh, he would sneak me out of the house in the middle of the night. Um, I remember actually, um, you know, feeling drugged in the house, and these men coming in, and they, he would he would take me out. He just he'd sneak me out of the house in the middle of the night, and my mom would be asleep, and. Uh, uh, that's how he gained access to me, also visits and things like that. But they did most of the experimentation in the middle of the night, and, uh, you know, he just found his way into the home. My mom had no knowledge of it at the time. She divorced him because I was afraid of him, and she couldn't figure out what was wrong. Um, and so he had to be sneaky in order to get a, a hold of me, and that's how he um, got, he would do that, is he, he would just... Uh, you know, he got the key from me, and, you know, he'd sneak in in the middle of the night and drag me out and bring me back before my mom would wake up, and um, that's when most of the experiments took place, and uh, I've talked to my mom since then now, since the memories have surfaced, and uh, she confirms that she absolutely believes that he was capable and did, in fact, um, participate in these experiments. Was he a member of the United States military? Uh, yes, he was. And do you remember other military people that were coming into your home at that time or that he would associate with or talk with? No, the only um, the only person I know what was my dad, uh, Don Ebner. Uh, now, I can, you know, tell you names of memos that I saw with uh, people um, from, like, um, well, from the military and internal affairs, memos I saw in Dr. Green's office, but uh, um, off the top of my head, I, I couldn't tell you the military names. Claudia, do you remember Dr. Green? Oh, very well. Um, the first time I met him, he, unlike uh, from my understanding now, most of the time he kept himself uh, disguised and used different names of depending on what part of the country he was in. At Tulane, he saw no reason to do that, I, I guess, and so he would wear a white coat just like any other doctor, and he wore a name tag, L. Wilson Green. Uh, but he didn't like anyone calling him anything but um, doctor. He didn't even like being called Dr. Green. And uh, I remember him, I knew him from the year 1957 uh, until, until about five years before he died in 88, 1988. So Dr. Green was operating at Tulane University and also at Kansas. University. He was going to Forty Four and in Tucson. He was and in Tucson. Dr. Tucson. Green has been reported. He is probably the most consistent figure or doctor that's reported by almost everybody. And he went under the names of Dr. Green, Dr. Green Mom, Green Tree, um, what else? Greenberg. Greenberg. Greenberg, but always with the green in his name. Um, and he traveled throughout the country, training people, offering consultation, and then also doing stuff on his own, I think, as Chris has experienced with. Yeah, and he was he used disguise with me as well. I never saw him without a surgical no, he mask. Use and, disguise with me. Oh, oh, well, oh, I'm sorry. I thought you said that. Um, he used, uh, he always had a surgical mask and uh, usually something on his head, and all I ever saw was uh, a little bit of, you know, the black rim glasses and whatever, and uh, I would, he was just a sadistic, evil man, and he hated me because I would not comply with what he wanted me to do. We have memories that have surfaced here at some point in time. Did both of you or either of you recall these memories before you got into therapy? Were there some memories at all of what had happened to you? Well, there would be times in my life over the years uh, since 
I was, I, I guess the last year I was in the, actually involved in the projects was 1983. After that, uh, I was supposed to be monitored by a doctor. Uh, that was a family friend and uh, who was to keep track and make sure that I wasn't ever getting any memory back. And if I was, he was to be reported to Dr. Heath or Dr. Green. And I would start to get somatic symptoms, a headache, uh, you know, just, I'd, I'd end up in the hospital and, uh, you know, they couldn't find any reason for the illness. They would call in this Dr. Brown and uh, then he would notify the other doctors and they would make sure that my, uh, you know, my amnesia was reinforced. And so then, forget. Valerie, what's the significance of these organic symptoms which presented? Basically, um, what you have to understand is how trauma memories are encoded. Um, and that's sort of the technical term for how memories are remembered. Um, there's been a lot of controversy recently about research on memory. There's been a lot of research done on memory. And what they're finding is a lot of the information that's now in the public is about normal memory. One of the things that those of us that work with traumatic memory is, have found is that it's very different, even as to where it's stored in the brain. Regular memories are stored in the area of the brain called the hippocampus. Uh, the um, trauma memories, I saw a re recent article, are stored in a more primitive part of the brain called the amyg amygdala. And basically what happens is, is that if there's information to remember and there's pain associated with the information, then the two get stored together in the brain. So in order to remember the information, you also remember the pain. And so what happens with um, these clients is that there was so much pain from the electric shock, from the other things that they did, or drug effects, because sometimes you get a drug effect or a very drugged kind of uh, memory. And um, But in terms of the physical pain, so as Claudia, for example, started to remember, the first thing she's going to remember is the pain wherever it is in her body that was stored with the information. Well, if you intervene and reinforce the amnesia, the pain before the information comes, you don't remember the information. In order for them to remember, they have to go through the pain first, and then the information comes. So is it fair to say, then, that the United States government was using the barrier of pain uh, as a barrier to memory? Absolutely, yes. At, and it's difficult. It's difficult, hard work. I mean, these two people are extremely courageous. They come in and they know that when they're working that they're going to be in a great deal of pain and they're willing to go through it because they want to be free. And I want to say the purpose of treatment here is not to uncover memories. The purpose of treatment here is to undo the messages that they were given. And there were a lot of them. And basically, I've been doing a lot of thinking recently as to why some people have to remember and some people don't, even though they've both been traumatized. And what I've realized is when someone is traumatized, if the perpetrator is silent, and when someone's tra traumatized, they basically go into a trance. Because you have to get away from it some kind of way, so you separate from yourself and you go into trance. If the perpetrator is silent, then nothing much really gets in. And those clients where the messages are separate from the actual trauma really don't have to remember the trauma. But those clients where the messages are part of the trauma have to remember the trauma. The point of therapy is to get to the context, to get to the conclusions that people drew about themselves and their world from the trauma to get to the things that were said to them and the things that were said to the people in the mind control subject uh, to the mind control subjects in the experimentation were deliberately said to undermine their personalities to make them self-destructive to make them not remember that's what we want to get to now, it so happens we have the memories, and I try to validate and verify where I can. But again, the thing is to restore their functioning. How many children do we believe were taken into these government programs for these purposes? Honestly, we really don't know. But just considering the numbers of people that are coming forward, um, our guess is thousands. Are they remembering rooms? 
electrodes, these kinds of things? The memories are extremely consistent. Um, in all kind, in preparation for my testimony, I sort of talked to a few people. Word got out, and um, almost forty therapists called me from all over the country, from California to New York, all over the country, giving me information. I supplied backup documentation, statements from clients all over the country, and it is remarkably consistent what they report. And these people don't know each other; they haven't talked to each other. And therapists, like, for example, me, I'm the only one in my area that I know of doing this work. I haven't really, I've talked to one other person, but I haven't really talked to all these people, nor have they talked to other people. So we're not sharing the information. We're hearing stuff independently. Chris, how did your memories begin to come out? And what can you tell us about your experience? In other words, you've told us about the rooms, yes. uh, you've told us about Dr. Green. Yes. Uh, how did you begin to remember these things, and in detail, in a synopsis, as much as you can, can share with us, what happened to you? Okay, um, I had no memory of anything until I was about 22 years old, and that is when I started to remember the sexual abuse uh, my dad sexually abused me and uh, then moving on in and it, it seems that I first started to uncover the uh, I would say the easier to handle memories the, the sex abuse memories were easier to handle than the mind control electrodes and all of that kind of thing the the, the uh, Kansas City thing I was telling you about when I was four years old that didn't come until later. I didn't remember that until maybe three months ago. Um, but uh, I started remembering the sexual abuse and then uh, went into remembering that I was uh, used, um, that I was, had memories of just being tortured and, and uh, well, actually just a, a lot of pain Dr. Green inflicting a lot of pain and and uh, a lot of um, different experiments. Uh, it, it's like uh, it's 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 hard to to wrap it all up in a nice little ball for you. But uh, um, can you describe some of the things that Dr. Green did to you? You mentioned a doll today. Yes, um, he performed. Uh, radiation experiment on me in the black room. Um, it was approximately in 1975 and uh, I was strapped down on my back naked and um, I had electrodes all over my body and uh, there was a machine and it looked somewhat like, uh, parts of it looked like an x-ray machine you might see in a dental office and he put three across my stomach and one pointing at my vagina and uh, he told me that I had um, the choice of either going outside and killing a doll which could have been a child or I could um, not do that and um, be a murderer as far as killing unborn children that I would never be able to have children and uh, he was trying to get me to go kill the doll, so to speak, because he was training me to be a spy assassin. And uh, I refused. I, I didn't want to have any, any part of killing anything, any, a doll, any sort of thing. Um, so I refused, and uh, he, um, he and, and my father was involved in this experiment. And they went around the corner and um, they flipped on a switch. I heard like a, a drone sound as the machine started up and then um, a buzzing sound. And I felt pain throughout my body um, all three times. And, uh, and then um, they, uh, it, it was because of the electric shock. They were shocking me at the same time they were doing the radiation. Then 
they came back out and said that I was a worthless, insignificant bitch and that I was um, a murderer and, you know, instilled all of these negative messages along with more electric shock. And uh, they, uh, after the radiation, I felt nauseated and threw up and Dr. Green got mad about that and started shocking me for that, gave me a shot. The next thing I knew, I was uh, out um, in the desert, strapped down on a table with more intensive electric shock and uh, to the point where I would pass out, continuing those messages, knowing that I was a good person, um, that that um, to think I was insignificant, that I was worthless, that I was a murderer would be devastating to me. Um, I mean, basically, he was he wanted me to commit suicide because I wouldn't do what he wanted me to do. I, I fought him all the way. Claudia, yes. do you remember your experiences? Oh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> I, there are so many. I was, uh, <clears throat> like I said, I was tested at Tulane and uh, at several other places outside New Orleans. And then once they decided that uh, I could become part of the projects, um, and they had a series of projects starting with the Umbrella Project and the Bluebird, which became Artichoke and just went MK Ultra on down the line. And each one had uh, a different purpose. <clears throat> I was taken on train trips on planes, small planes, to different uh, military bases. Um, I was taken to uh, places out in, uh, in the woods. Uh, and um, I mean, I received mainly, I guess a Tulane was the worst uh, where I would see, receive intensive electric shock. Isolation for days, sleep dep deprivation, where they would uh, attach electrodes to you, and if you start to fall asleep, it, it would uh, shock you just enough to wake you up. And so every time you, you and so you couldn't sleep for days. And the messages Chris was talking about, I don't know what her messages were, but mine were: uh, your mother doesn't love you; she left you here; she doesn't want you; uh, you're just a, you know too much trouble for. Her. You're, you're a very evil child. You want to hurt people. You want to entice men. Uh, uh, you like fa you, you, you like your uh, my my adopted father was very ill and he died when I was young and so I was taught to uh, to take to older men and encouraged to you know become friendly with older men. And eventually the goal was when I was old enough, when I would become, I would be sent out as a, into the, what they call the operational field. Uh, and I would be photographed with officials, government officials, uh, agency officials, meaning the CIA, the doctors that were consulted, uh, heads of, uh, in, um, universities and uh, private foundations, all in under the chance that the gov government would begin to start dwindling down the funds that, that they supplied for these projects. And if that should happen, they wanted to be able to, you know, blackmail or coerce the men into, you know, making sure the projects continue. That was the ultimate goal was the projects had to continue at all costs. And so that was one of the ways. So they had to train a certain amount of young females to to go around. And um, and um, I was taught, I was sent to a camp in Maryland for three weeks when I was nine years old. Uh, and that was my first training on how to sexually please men. And they actually, I was went through a training course. It was like a seminar <laughs> only for children. There were children of all ages. There were children even younger than myself, and I was only nine. There was teenagers, young adult girls there. Uh, and we were all assigned someone, and for three weeks we were taught. And at the end of three weeks, they decided that uh, it was a success. And it was a CIA project. It was called Imaginative Research. Uh, they had to give a name to it that, you know, they could release and that they could document because I couldn't obviously put 
what it really was. It came under the heading um, MK uh, Ultra. Uh, I believe it was Project Number Seventy Four. Um, and I was subject number three. All I remember is being given a number. We were allowed to choose a name because, you know, and uh, after the three weeks I was sent home and uh, then I was, like Chris, I was, um, for the next few years, they worked on being sure they were on behavior control and amnesia, making sure that the amnesia barrier, as I called it, would remain in place so that if something should ever happen to me and I got, uh, the memory should start coming back, the pain would come first. I would seek help from the doctors who I was taught were my, you know, the only people that could help me, the good doctors. I was taught that doctors were the answer to everything. And um, I had no reason not to believe that because every time I, I was sent home, I was told, oh, you're a good girl, you, you're cured, uh, um, you're going to be just fine, you're going to have grow up and have a, a lot of kids, I didn't even realize that they had taken that away from me. They made sure that I couldn't have bear children. How did they do that? Um, mainly by uh, inserting things, electric shock, uh, some of the testing they did, they just it produced enough scar material that it blocked my uh, fallopian tubes and I can't have children. You were tortured? Yes. How many times? <laughs> <laughs> from 1957 to 1983, uh, I mean, sometimes it would be for a week at a time, sometimes it would be only overnight, sometimes it would be, uh, you know, uh, once a month. It, it just depended. It had it had to, of course, adapt to my uh, school schedule. I went to a private Catholic girls' school, uh, and when I was taken out of school for periods of time, my mother would tell them, well, she has to go... Um, to um, she's uh, she has to go visit relatives, or her father is very sick. He wants to spend time with her before you know. My father was terminal. She they had no reason to question my mother's motives. My mother was just told by the doctors she needs to come back for some treatment, and it would always coincide with times when the men could get away, holidays. Um, that um, and I would be sent to the CIA kept. For for I know for a fact two hotel rooms in one of two of the best hotels in New Orleans and year round they kept a pres well not a presidential suite but a suite and it was um, unique in that it had two bathrooms and one bathroom was where they kept the hidden cameras and I was actually shown the hidden cameras by the three men that that handled that part of it and. Um, that was, uh, they called him Captain George White. He was really a doctor. And he was used to be in, in the narcotics squad in California. And then he joined, uh, then he became a doctor. Then he joined the CIA. Uh, and then there was two other men that worked with him. And they would procure the subjects that would be filmed with the men. And then when the men would come into town, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, when local politicians, government officials, anybody that they needed to, possibly get something on or keep on file for future reference, you know, should they need to coerce this person into supporting the projects, senators, congressmen, anything like that. If they were in town, they were given this, you know, room, they had no reason to think there was anything strange about the room. It didn't look any different from any other room. It was just one of the better suites in the hotels. There were two hotels that were used. And, um, I was shown how the cameras were set up behind mirrors, behind the mirrors which are in every hotel room, over the dresser. And um, they would sit there and they would film it. And then later on, he would show me the films. And they would say, you don't want anyone to see this now, do you? You know, and that was one way of getting me to want to forget about it. You mentioned the CIA. We've heard the word CIA again and again mm -hmm. from your memory. CIA type documents have come up. Mm -hmm. You were listening as a child and you yes. heard things, you saw things. Well, I, they started uh, when I was very young, like I said, and um, they they knew that my they would be able to produce this amnesia. They were so certain that the amnesia would hold for as long as they wanted it to 
that they felt no reason to, to, to hide anything from me. Plus, they considered me too young to understand what they were talking about. It was very important, you know, you've got to understand, to keep the child that you're, you're working with isolated from anyone else so that no one, you know, asks them any questions or, you know, so that they learn to trust just the people, the doctors, the scientists, the researchers, uh, the consultants. They have to learn to trust these people. I mean, these are the doctors that are helping you. That's what you're taught. But you can't be around even nurses in a hospital. Uh, so they would always keep me very close by. And they would put me on a sofa and give me a blanket and say, you know, take a nap. And give me something to make me sleepy. Well, and I was told, you know, try, you know, this is very important to the president. Uh, he would prefer you not to look at their faces. I was, uh, I understood that the president, you know, I thought the president knew about all this, of course. I thought I was helping my country. I was told this is to help stop communism. We understand we need to do something to stop communism. You were how old? Well, when I was first told this, um, I was nine when I went to the Deep Creek Cabots in Maryland. Um, that's when I was taught that I was going to be part of this project, that I had been accepted into this project that could help the government stop communism. And at that time, the Cold War was on, and it was very important. And we were even taught in schools about communists. And, you know, so they had no reason to think that uh, they had to hide anything from us. So they would have conversations about the projects, about so-and-so, what he's working on, where he is, where he's from. They would call each other by name. They would have um, suitcases with their names, the name tags on it, briefcases. Um, I met with Richard Helms, who was deputy director of the CIA for a long time. I met with him lots of times. And uh, I mean, I got to know them on a first name basis, or they would say, call me uncle. And um, of course, every now and then they would expect um, a favor, but they would be assured that they were not being filmed. Of course, somehow they managed to film almost everybody, except Dr. Dr. Martin Orn, who's the only one who never got on film. We're talking about sexual intercourse here with very young women. Yes. Mm -hmm. How young? Well, there were children younger than myself. I saw children as young as five years old. Sexual intercourse? Well, actually it was anal intercourse until you got to a certain age. Until you were sent out into the field as an op, you know, to target these officials and get them on film. The idea what, being that uh, they wouldn't want a child that had been abused over a long period of time. They would want to think that you were young and innocent and pure and this was your first time. And so you were taught um, other ways to please men other than, you know, sexual intercourse. I mean, there was anal intercourse, oral, you know, oral sex, uh, everything else, you name it. From memory, do you remember the names of some of these projects that you may have seen mm -hmm. written or heard, spoken? Uh, well, under the umbrella folder is what they called. The main one came, the first one was artichoke, which was to produce amnesia and uh, also to develop polygraph techniques. And that's where Dr. Martin Orne came in. He was um, supposed to be an expert on the polygraph. Uh, he worked for the Technical Science Division of uh, Edgewood Arsenal, as did Dr. Richard Green. I mean, L. Wilson Green, not Richard Green. I'm sorry. Um, there was um, M.K. Delta, MK Naomi, which was germ warfare, I was told. I was told how they, they were laughing about how they would drop canisters of, of, of uh, toxins that they had no idea what it was going, what effect it was going to have, and they would just have to wait five or ten years and see what the effects on this neighborhood was, a poor neighborhood they would choose. Um, I was told about using retarded children in East New Orleans um, and exposing them to large doses of massive radiation. And they saw no reason not to use them because they were already retarded. So they just wanted to see what, can, what ana anomalies would develop over the years. You were allowed to testify today, mm -hmm. I would assume, because there was radiation involved. Yes, that's all. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience with radiation? Well, I was exposed to not as much, I think, as, as a lot. Um, I was exposed to a lot of x-rays because of uh, they had to... 
I was given physicals quite often to make sure that I was kept healthy. And I was given, and since they knew that I, they didn't want me to be able to ever bear children, they wanted to make sure that I was become sterile. And so they, um, they exposed me to radiation for that purpose, I believe, also uh, to scare you. And they never protected me in any way. They never covered me with any kind of lead apron or anything. Um, but mainly I overheard about the massive doses of radiation that were exposed to large areas of people. I wasn't involved in that. I just overheard conversations. I received small doses of radiation. I was fortunate in that way. Chris, today you talked about being in a cage and escaping and some of the documents that you saw? Yes. Um, that took place between 1972 and 1976. And uh, basically, um, Dr. Green had taught me many techniques as to, you know, how to be a spy. And I didn't want to have anything to do with them. And I was angry. And uh, they would put me in a cage um, after uh, traumatizing me in some form or another and um, uh, there were times when they were careless in this period of time and whenever physically possible I snuck into Dr. Green's office and looked at files. Um, these files contained project, subproject, subject and experiment names um, uh, for uh, the uh, CIA uh, projects of the CIA, uh, yeah, and um, what I, I I saw all of these different files at first, okay, and uh, they were all coded with different colors. A purple stood for something, and orange, and and some were on radiation, and and the one that I saw on radiation, I I opened it, and it. Um, I had a photograph, photographic memory, and I remembered exactly what was written, subject name, code number, and then the names and some of the code numbers, and then experiment names, code numbers, and then some of those names. Um, I also uh, remember seeing memos um, to, uh, they would have a subject name, code number, CIA classified, and then six-digit number, um, to either some Frank Harris Internal Affairs um, from Trenton Cox and Alias that Dr. Green used, and uh, also um, I would always say confidential information on it, and um, then there would be the code number again, the experiment name, and then subject explanation, either successful or unsuccessful, colon, and then the all of the, uh, a, a brief summary of their findings on that subject in that particular experiment. The project, subproject, uh, subject and experiment names um, that I've remembered, the memos, the CIA memos that I saw and have written out um, by memory have not been verified at this point in time. They just recently surfaced uh, within the last three months. Um, so I cannot say, as with Claudia, the uh, MK Ultra, it's verified. It's it, my the, the names that I've seen and, and every all the information that I have written out that I typed out for um, to to give to the committee today. Uh, presidential committee, I, I, I didn't have it. Um, none of that's been verified by Alan Shefflin at this point. He hasn't had a chance to research it. However, he has been able to um, uh, verify that the format and some of the terminology and some of the names, such as Robert Levine, or Levine, uh, one of the people who was uh, on one of the memos, um, uh, that he could verify that. So he could verify the format of what I was remembering as far as the memos, uh, 
maybe some of the project names, I don't know. That's not something I know yet. The project names had to change from time to time. You've got to understand. They couldn't keep the same project name uh, because they had to get funding from different sources. The funding couldn't continue from the same source for any length of time. The government only would sponsor it until 1963, and then the president put a halt to it, supposedly. So they started getting it from different other sources, and then they changed the project names. They were constantly changing. There was Project Often. There was Project Chatter. Well, that was one of the early ones with a, a Dr. Went was head of that, and that was uh, to get interrogation techniques to get soldiers to talk that would capture POWs. Uh, I mean, it, the list went on and on. You know, I mean, I overheard so many names and sub-project num numbers. I, I remember the numbers, you know, uh, the ones having to do with sex had low numbers. It was, pro you know, Project 2, 7, you know, 3, 7, 12, and they were mainly under uh, Dr. James Hamilton. He was the head of those. Uh, he was one of the consultants. He didn't work for the CIA, but he was a consultant for the CIA. And uh, with me, actually, they, Dr. Green started to go, um, he really couldn't do it in the laboratories anymore as much, so he went into um, uh, kind of uh, criminal type Sex rings? sex rings? Sex rings, yeah. Yeah, that's basically, yeah, sex rings. And uh, that's where he continued his experiments in, in that sort he of setting. And that was more more of a setting. Yeah, but with me in Tucson, Arizona, that's, oh. that's how, I mean, that was my experience with him. You mentioned Tucson earlier today, and you described drives that you took from one place to another. Would you talk about that a bit? Uh, Up until about two and a half years ago, um, I, I'm 32 years old now, so up until I was about 29, I would get calls from time to time, and I would not remember the phone call. All I knew is that I would be driving to Tucson, Arizona from California, I was living in California at the time, and I didn't know why, my adrenaline was pumping, I was like, I had to get there, I had to get there, I had to get there, that's all I knew is that I had to get there. Um, on one particular occasion I had to, I was supposed to arrive at a certain hotel on a certain day and time. I was able to somehow break it and turn around and drive home before I got there um, to the hotel. Um, so, uh, but yes, they monitored me up until that time. Valerie, what were they doing? Basically, uh, this is being reported across the country. There are certain segments of these clients that were being followed and monitored. One of the things that they knew is that eventually the amnesia would break down and that they would need to do periodic checkups and periodic reinforcement of the amnesia. So the people that they had worked particularly hard with, I think they assigned either relatives or family friends or people who are associated with the project but not really on the payroll of the CIA or the Army to uh, monitor them so that if they showed any signs of having having body memories that we talked about before the pain or anything like that then they could move in and um, reinforce the amnesia. I think one of the reasons that we're hearing about this more now and why there's so much there was so much interest in it two and a half years ago is because it's been a while. I mean, it's been a long time, and I think the memories are breaking down. The amnesia is breaking down. The viewers are going to ask one question. What's that? Why? Why would the U.S. government do that? Do you have an answer in your own mind? Well, they thought at, at first, I think they, they thought they had good intentions. They thought that it was the best way to handle uh, the Cold War. Uh, Dr. Green himself said that he could come up with uh, war without using guns, without using any kind of, uh, I mean, he ran, he was, he worked at the Edgewood Arsenal, and um, he wanted war without death. So he said, control your mind, control behavior, and you've got war without death. Chris? Yet, I don't believe that that fit with his personality. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? Um, I don't, uh, that he, uh, really had an ulterior motive. He was oh. a very arrogant, cruel man to be able to do these things. 
and to feel power from doing this to people. Oh, he, he enjoyed was, it. Yes. He was into power. He loved it. That was probably just to make him sound like he was a wonderful man, a, a scientist. But I believe, like Chris does, he was just a, a sadistic, cold-hearted, and he enjoyed torturing children. I think the other element here, and if you listen carefully to what they've said, is a lot of this, I think, was done for the personal gratification of the people involved. Sexual gratification, sadistic gratification. Um, I think they had fun. And, I mean, that's putting it very crudely, but I think that's another reason why it got continued as long as it did. You've been listening to an interview with Valerie Wolf, Claudia Mullen, and Chris Ebner done the day just after they gave testimony of mind control experimentation on children to the presidential hearings on radiation experiments on humans done in March 15th of uh, 95. You also heard uh, them give accounts of uh, the national security establishment being able, through mind control, to coerce prominent officials by sexually blackmailing them using children. Next week, we're going to hear the start of a three-part in-depth interview with Claudia Mullen. And uh, also, I should mention, uh, starting this Monday at 10 p.m., uh, this series will be rebroadcast on CKLN, uh, 10, 10 p.m. to 11 p.m. It's uh, going to be every Monday, and uh, that will uh, be about a three-month delay from the, uh, the uh, shows on this time slot on Sunday mornings. Stay tuned next. You're listening to CKLN 88.1. Tejendo Rebeldias is up next.